Please turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 1, we'll be reading from verses 5 through 25. Luke 1, 5 through 25. The words that you're about to hear read to you, the very words of God. Please give them full attention as they're read to you this morning. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statues of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news. And behold, you will be silent and un unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked upon me to take away my reproach from among the people. Well, the grass will wither and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Our just and holy God, we call out to you for help to rightly lay hold of your word, to understand it. And to God, we pray that it would not just be us who would lay hold of your word, but that it, your word would lay hold of us. That it would change us and transform us by your spirit's power in our lives. Oh God, use your word as a mighty encouragement to your people this morning. We pray this in our Savior's great name. Amen. Well, I want to ask you this morning... If you've ever, as I move these things out of the way, that's not what I'm asking you. Have you ever felt like God just doesn't see your affliction? Have you ever felt like uh, w when you're in a difficult season of life and, and you're, you pray to God, you call out to God in the middle of that difficulty, does it ever feel like God doesn't hear your prayer? 
do you, do you ever like read through sections of, of Scripture and like when you land on Isaiah chapter 40, you read things that they hit a little too close to home. Isaiah 40 says, my way is hidden from the Lord. And my, and my right is disregarded by my God. Do you ever read passages like that and think, even as you do, that's how I feel sometimes. That, that the season of affliction that I'm right in the middle of, God can't see, or that the prayers that I'm praying, God cannot hear. Maybe my situation is, is so small and insignificant, He cannot see me, or my prayer is so little that he didn't hear it. And maybe that is where you have found yourself this morning. Or maybe upon reflection, that is where you have been in the past. Or possibly you've gone beyond that point. And that season of affliction was so long, you thought, well, surely God must see it. Or you thought, I've prayed too many times. It's, it's impossible that he wouldn't hear it. And so maybe the place where you're at isn't so much that God doesn't see or that God doesn't hear. Maybe the place where you're at is, I know that he sees. I know that he hears. I'm beginning to wonder, does he care? He does care. But that knowledge sometimes isn't enough to prevent us from, from thinking that. Beloved, if that's you this morning, I have a story from the Word of God that you desperately need to hear. One that I need to hear. I want to walk through this story with you in four major portions. Now, one of the ways that we... Uh, uh, approach ministry here at King's Cross is that we want to expound uh, the Word of God each and every week, and and part of what dictates that is what book of the Bible we're in. So if we're in First Timothy, which we just finished up, it's it's a letter, it's teaching, it's formal, and it should be kind of preached that way. But Luke is a, a little different this morning. It's it's a story, it's a narrative, and so stories are meant to be told. And stories are meant to, uh, to invite the listener into them and so that you would not just kind of hear the truths, but that you could see them, taste them, feel them, know them. And, and so I, I, I want to, as much as I'm able this morning, to, to walk us through this story and say, if you feel like God doesn't see you or God doesn't hear you, um, that's just simply not true. He does hear you. He does see you. He does care. And let me walk us through the Bible in this story and, and show you why that's true. And so I want to do that this morning under four major headings. And the first is this, barren in more ways than one. If you look at verse 5, you'll see that uh, Luke begins this historic account of a, of a real series of events by saying, In the days of Herod, the king of Judea. And any story needs its setting set. And Luke, as a good storyteller, tells you the, the, the background of what is playing in this story. He says that what you do is you find yourself on the pages of Scripture, and you, in this context, are coming out of 400 years of God not speaking to his people. 400 years of Assyrian exile and Babylonian exile, and when they came back out of that exile, things were not at all what they imagined. Change of governments from Babylon to Greece and others, and now they're under Rome. They are not a self-governed people. And the person who is kind of at the top of that food chain is, is a person, um, very humble person, assigned himself the name Herod the Great, uh, and he presented himself as the Davidic ruler. He put himself forward as that son of David that you should expect, and yet anyone who knew their Bibles, they knew one thing painfully uh, clear. This is not David's son that we're waiting for. 
This is a corrupt puppet that Rome has set up so that they could kind of rule and placate the people that are under their boot. And, and, and Herod is not the son of David we're waiting for. In fact, if you were a faithful Jew at this time, one of the questions you would wonder is, God promised us that David's sons would rule us. Where is David's son to rule us? Instead of David's son, you have a puppet king set up by a pagan empire by Rome. You might say Israel is barren, at least with regards to David's house. They're also barren in, an, in another aspect. They're barren in the sense that they have waited for one to come and deliver them from such rulers like Rome. And as they look around, they don't see anyone who can do that. And then it's, it's in that context of 400 years of silence, of a, uh, of a total absence of a Davidic ruler in place, that Luke introduces you to the two characters of our story. It's in the second half of verse 5. And yet in the midst of this bleak, dire situation, there's a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughter of Aaron, daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And so here, in, in great contrast to just the, the difficulty of being under Rome and under Herod and all of the bad things that are happening, here are two stellar, God-believing, obedient people who trust God's purposes for their life. Here, here's a priest named Zechariah. I mean, you would just want your life to look like his. A faithful man, Luke tells you, walking in obedience, verse 6, righteous before God. And he's part of the tribe of Levi, and in the subset of Levi, he's part of uh, the division called Abijah. Now, Luke, uh, Luke employs a lot of storytelling techniques, and one of them is he'll play around or draw attention to names. And already before you know that, uh, what, what the difficulty of the story is, he introduces someone to you whose priest division means God is, is my father. He introduces the, the idea of being a father in this difficult context, and that will be important in a little bit. Zechariah is not just from good stock himself, and not just from a good house, and of, of a good trade. He's a priest, and not just one who walks righteously, but, but he, he actually married well. It says he married a daughter of Levi, or from the daughters of Aaron. Uh, now, for a young Levite to marry a, a daughter of Aaron, I mean, that is swinging for the fence, uh, that is like marrying a Reformed Baptist minister's daughter, just to contextualize it, just to bring it into the present. Like many of us, he married way out of his league, but that's just who Elizabeth was. Uh, she's actually named the same name of Aaron's wife. Aaron's wife's name was Elizabeth, Exodus chapter 6 says. So here's a picture-perfect couple. Living faithfully in a difficult scenario, walking with God, and he even just tells you, blameless, walking after God, righteous, verse 6 says. And then verse 7 should fall just with, a, a, with cracking difficulty to bear. But they did not have children. And friends, tucked behind that little verse is a lifetime of pain. Don't, don't read over the story so fast that you're like, okay, guy got his name, got his priesthood, oh, they don't have kids, we're moving on. No, no, no. S read it slow enough that you understand that they're advanced in years. We'll find out at the end of verse 7. So here's a couple who, if we could just use kind of looser language, did everything right. And yet they don't have any children which would have been seen by their surrounding friends as God's punishment on them. Elizabeth says at the end of the story that she's born reproach. Her friends would have thought, you know, a little goody two-shoes Elizabeth may look righteous, but there must be some hidden sin. Why? She doesn't have kids. Could you imagine what that would be like? Friends, do you understand the difficulty that that would have caused in their marriage? How many times do you think Elizabeth and Zechariah prayed for children with tears? For how many decades do you think Zechariah and Elizabeth 
pled with God to answer their prayers. How many times do you think Zechariah had to hold his wife as she cried at night? I can guarantee you it was many. How many times do you think Elizabeth thought, and whether she said it or not, I do not know, Zechariah, I wish you would have married a woman who wasn't broken. Don't rush over details in stories like this. And to make matters worse, as far as human biology is at work, the, the opportunity for that is over. They're advanced in years. Childbearing years were difficult enough, and, and, but there was still that sliver of hope that maybe God will answer in this way. But guess what? When, when your biology changes, it seems like that God's resounding answer to dozens of years of prayer was, was no, no, and no. Excruciatingly difficult to deal with. But friends, God had a purpose in Elizabeth's barrenness. God is working in this story throughout the decades of this difficulty to bring about a course of events that will glorify him and ultimately will provide for them. And what we need to remember is we, we, we have the, the privilege of being story readers. We kind of know where this is going. <laughs> they were real people who didn't. And imagine them is looking at God's difficult providences and deducing from them the same thing that you and I so often deduce. Either he does not see or he does not care. I don't think that they were immune from such doubts, just like we are not immune from such doubts. Reminds me of a line from one of my favorite hymns, Whate'er my God ordains is right. I, I prefer the the German title says, whatever God does is good. There's a line in there. It warns us. It says, judge not the Lord by feeble sense. The warning is be careful as you walk through life to connect dots about what God is doing when you do not know what God is doing. Just like Elizabeth and Zechariah probably thought that, that God uh, either was punishing them or that God didn't care about them or that God didn't hear them or whatever conclusions they might have drawn from it. They, they may have uh, judged God by feeble sense like we so often do and drawn um, conclusions that ought not be drawn. I agree with Phil Riken when he says Elizabeth's barrenness was for the glory of God. Uh, the Decades of Elizabeth's difficulty is set before us like, like just a black backdrop upon which the glory of God's work in this story will shine even more brightly. I mean, even as you read the story, or heard me read the story, it should have brought to mind other stories that you've already read in the Bible, shouldn't it have? Barren? Advanced in years? Isn't that the same exact phrase that God used with Abraham and Sarah? I mean, word for word. Barren and advancing. And, and we, maybe even as we read it, we smirked a little bit like, oh, I've, I, know how this, I know how stories like this go in the Bible. I know how stories like this go. And God's drawing our attention for what he's a, about to do in the life of this couple. And there, there's also a lot of attention drawn to to Aaron, whether it's with that they were Levites or whether they were the house of Abijah or whether they were um, from the daughters of Aaron. There's all of these allusions and references to Aaron, and it should take our mind back to, well, to when Aaron lived. And what was the setting uh, in which Aaron lived? How long were they in slavery? About 400 years, give or take. Had God talked to them in all that 400 years? No, not since the final prophecy of Jacob. Did they think that God had forgotten them? Probably. Hmm. Did God use that to then lead them out of that bondage into, into freedom? Yeah. 
Yet God loves to take difficult, destroyed situations, especially after you've begun to think he doesn't see or doesn't care, and he loves to use that setting to work powerfully. We've read the story of Aaron. We've read the story of Abraham. We know how this goes. So in that scenario with Elizabeth's barrenness, the house of David's barrenness, Israel's barrenness, we're ready to see God work. Friends, I want to remind you that your difficulty and affliction does not prevent God from working. It is often the scene in which he delights to work. Zechariah, I said names are important. Zechariah was tempted to think what? God has forgotten me. Do you know what his name means? God has remembered again. So here's a man whose name, who believes God's forgotten him, whose name means God has remembered you, whether you, whether you remembered it or not. God has remembered you, and we, we have all the stages set for God to bring life out of death and for God to bring freedom out of slavery, and the scene is set beautifully. And so secondly, we want to note this morning, the silent one speaks. The silent one speaks. I'm realizing now David was holding up my T that I left in the back, and the answer has changed from a no to a yes, whenever that can happen. Thank you. The silent one speaks. So if you just look at verse 8, now while he was serving the he is Zechariah, while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty. Thank you. I just thought you were being odd. <laughs> so there were 24 divisions within Levite. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> There were 24 divisions within Levi, Abijah, I think is number eight in the row. And what would happen was that they would be scheduled to serve in the temple and they would come on duty for one week, twice a year. So for that time, you would come to Jerusalem, you would, you would serve in whatever capacities were needed, and then you would, you would go home. And there, the priesthood was, was huge during this time period. There were lots of priests in all of the divisions, and so um, chances to serve were, were kind of rare. And of the duties that were available or that priests were called on to serve, one of them was very significant. Twice a day, someone would be chosen to go into the holy place to, to enter that first room in the temple and to, on behalf of the nation of Israel, offer incense on the altar of incense, pray for the people, and then there was another duty that they would carry out. And they would choose that person based on, on the casting of lots. And so you had, it only came up twice a year, and you had about a one in 1,000 chance of being selected. You, once you were selected, were never eligible to do that again. So what you're reading is a, literally a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and an opportunity that not every priest had the pleasure of serving us. In fact, just a small portion of the priests would get to do this. So with that in mind, read verse uh, 8. He was serving as a priest when his division was on duty. According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot. What an accident! But you know that every lot and decision of the dice cast comes from God. And he was chosen to enter the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. So here's a man who we know is righteous because the, the Bible tells us that, who everyone else thinks is what? Has some secret as to why he's barren. And he gets a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Interesting. More than just interesting, delightful to watch God's providence lead and guide even when they, or especially when they don't see that that is exactly what he is doing. If we're not careful... What we might do is to forget or to downplay what that duty was. You understand that, that many were within Israel were allowed to come to the outer courts. Only the Levites were allowed to become or to be involved with the tabernacle or the temple itself. Do you know what it would have been like to be a son of Aaron and to go into the holy place 
and to see the articles of your religion that were uniquely bound to that house for yourself. To see the candlesticks that represented the tree of life on the left. To see the cherubim and the garden scene carved in the golden walls. To see the table of showbread on the right and then right in front of the the veil that separated you from the, the holy of holy place, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, the place where God's glory sat. Right up against that veil was this altar where you'd put coals and offer incense. And so you would be the single closest human being to the glory of God. Can you imagine what it would be like to stand there knowing that a few feet away was the glory of God that has traveled with his people for, mil- for hundreds of years by this point. What an honor. And so that's the scene that we find in verses 8, 9, and 10 says that while this is happening, as he goes into prayer on behalf of the people to be their representative to go before the veil and pray, outside is the congregation and everyone is praying while this is happening, waiting for him to come back. And so while he's in there, verse 11, there appeared something that didn't happen for 400 years. There appeared an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar. In Solomon's temple, at the temple prior to this one, there were two golden statues of cherubim guarding the entrance to the veil. Now here in Zerubbabel's temple, or what would later be called Herod's temple, in that exact spot is not just a representation a real one, a real angel that was been prefigured forever, or for as long as this has been a thing in redemptive history, and there is standing an angel of God, and Zechariah responds just like we would, maybe a little better than we would. He was troubled when he saw him. This is not a chubby infant hovering like we depict them <laughs> Now, this was a terrifying messenger, uh, an angelic being who came from God. We know from verse 19, we know he has a name. We only really kind of know the names of one or two angels, depending on how we read uh, some verses in Daniel. This is the one that we know for sure. This is Gabriel. I told you names were important. His name means a valiant one of God, which is an awesome name. Um... As Gabriel shows up, scares uh, Zechariah. Zechariah was supposed to be the only person in there. Then all of a sudden, I I think the hairs on his arms stood up. He's realized, like, I'm not alone, and that's weird because I should be, um, only to see Gabriel. We often think Gabriel shows up way more often than he does. He only shows up four times. This is time number three. Time number four is coming later on in this same chapter. He only shows up two other times. And the two other times are in two back-to-back chapters in the book of Daniel. When Gabriel comes to deliver a prophecy, uh, guess about what course of events? The coming of the Son of Man into the world. That was 600 years before this time period. And so being Zechariah, knowing the Bible, can you imagine meeting someone... And you, ask, you find out their name is Gabriel. And you go, I know that name. Gabriel from the book of Daniel? Yes, the very same. Wait, wait, Gabriel who talked about the one who would come into the world and then would be cut off and, and like all of that, Gabriel? The very same. And Gabriel not just shows up and tells him who he is, but look what he tells him in verse 13. Be, don't be afraid, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you'll call his name John. I mean, this is a lot of info to take in altogether. Uh, the, the angel Gabriel shows up and says, uh, don't be afraid, which is a kind of humorous because I don't think it solved much. But uh, don't be afraid. I'm here to tell you your prayer. The first thing out of his mouth, your prayer was heard. And God is answering your prayer. Your wife, who is not just barren, but now doubly barren, 
will have a son. And we're even going to provide the name for you. Name him John, which means God has been gracious. Imagine being Zechariah, taking it all in. I'm about to have a son. My wife, Elizabeth, is going to bear that son. And we're supposed to name the kid God is full of grace? See, God is working in his life. And God's not just working in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. But he's working far more than that. Look at verse 14. Verse, at the end of verse 13, you'll call his name John, verse 14. And you will have joy and gladness, you and Elizabeth, and many. And so it's not just that God is working in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life, but God is working in, in the life of the nation, we'll find out later, in the life of the world in what he's doing. God's doing so much here from what? From a prayer. And if you're like me, you ask questions about the text that don't have answers, but you ask them anyway. What prayer? Like the prayer he just prayed? Did Zechariah, when he drew near to the altar of incense, in his late 50s or 60s, pray for a son? Maybe. Maybe. Given his response to the angel telling him, you're going to have a son, I don't know if that's what he prayed for. <laughs> he doesn't believe the angel's account in a few verses and, to and totally doubts it and is kind of disciplined for his doubt. I don't know if he did. But it had to be in his mind. What kind of looks do you think he and Elizabeth exchanged at the house when they found out he was going to be the one to go pray? Did he say it? Did she say it? Did it have to be said? Maybe the reference to God has heard your prayer wasn't the one at the altar. But it might have been one prayed decades before. How many times do you think they prayed for children? Countless. Could it be that that is what's being referred to? Maybe. I don't know. Could it be that, the, that what Zechariah prayed was that God would help his people? Probably pretty safe to think that it would be something like that. Like, Lord, we're under Roman occupation. Please come and free us. Maybe all those prayers tied together. While I don't know which prayer he heard, might have been the one that day, might have been a previous one, the point remains. God hears prayer. Don't, don't let the uncertainty about which prayer exactly it was cloud that very clear truth. God heard the prayer of just a Joe nobody. I'm really sorry if someone here's name is Joe, but a Joe nobody who prayed just a regular old prayer. God heard it. What do we think that Zechariah Doubted all those years that God hears prayer? Nothing can be further from the truth. What does the angel say? Your prayer has been heard. The feeble, weak mutterings that we utter here, God hears them. Combat the lie that God does not hear my prayers or your prayers with the truth of God's word. He hears. That's what it, Gabriel says. Now, look at what the angel says to him, not just that he will have a son, but notice who this son will be. The angel says to him in verse 15, he, speaking of John, will be great before the Lord. Uh, there's some limitations that in some ways reflect a Nazarite vow and in other ways don't, but, but the essence is that he will be set apart or marked uh, is, is for a special duty or a special office that he will fulfill, filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, and he will, now this is odd language, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. That's not super odd, but look what verse 17 says. 
Go before him in the power, spirit and power of Elijah. That's an Old Testament prophet from way back in the day. And he'll turn the hearts of fathers to children and the disobedient to wisdom. And he'll make ready for the Lord a people prepared. There's kind of these pieces at play that, that just don't, they don't make a whole lot of sense if we're not reading with the Old Testament in our mind. Uh, the, the pieces of he will go bef- he'll go before. Before who? He's the spirit and the power of Elijah. Elijah's been dead. He'll prepare the way for the Lord. The Lord is coming from where to where. And if we just could read it with a little bit of Old Testament literacy, we would, we would quickly find out that uh, Gabriel is actually quoting three different passages to Zechariah, who I trust knew his Bible and uh, would have known exactly what was being referenced. Malachi 3.1, one of the last words that Israel heard before the 400 years of silence, give or take, it says, Behold, I'm sending my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Who's speaking? God is speaking. God says, There will come a time where I will send someone and he will come right before I come. Right before I arrive on the seat. And and listen, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Where is Zechariah standing at this very moment? In the temple? Could you imagine hearing that your son will be the one who comes right before I come, and I will stand where you stand. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. That's Malachi 3. Malachi 4 says, Behold, I will send uh, send you Elijah the prophet before the great and the awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children. It's a direct quote from Gabriel. Gabriel's stealing from Malachi. And the hearts of the children back to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the land in utter destruction. God says, before I come back, I'm going to send one like Elijah with the spirit and the power of Elijah. And he's got a task that is to get the land ready for me to come. Or Isaiah chapter 40, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. Every valley lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. The the uneven ground shall become level, the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. Where is, his, where is Zachariah standing at the moment he hears the angel say a reference to that? A few feet from what? The glory of the Lord. Can he see it? No. Why? There's a veil in the way. He's not the high priest. This is not the day of atonement. He does not get to go back there. And even though he was the closest human to the glory of God... He's being told his son will announce, or his son is the one preparing the way for the one who comes, and the one who comes will be the glory of God, and all flesh will see it. Now, he doesn't have the benefit of reading the Gospel of John, where he says of Jesus Christ, we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But his son will be the forerunner for that. His son will be the forerunner for when the Lord comes to his temple, when the glory returns to the land, when God makes himself known. Can you imagine the thoughts that must have been running through Zachariah's mind right then? Overwhelmed, I'm sure. Overwhelmed staggered at the text just the 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 amount of old testament text must have been spinning through his mind i mean isaiah chapter 2 and chapter 9 and chapter 11, i mean just all of them rolling around in his mind as he went you you mean that those days have dawned and the thing that is bringing this about is some prayer i prayed that you're answering yeah that's exactly what gabriel says 
The God who's been silent for 400 years speaks. I want to note thirdly this morning, not just does the silent one now speak, the speaking one is now silenced. Look at verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? You might say, decent question. Same thing Abraham said. Abraham didn't get in trouble. Well, um, there could be some differences. Uh, Gabriel knows that Zechariah is saying this out of doubt or unbelief. Uh, he says as much in verse 20. You did not believe my words. Gabriel knows that. So when Zechariah says, how will I know this? And he gives a reason. He says, I'm an old man. And my wife is, now I know it's not in the text, but there's some dots in there. My wife is dot, 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 mature in years. Here's a man who's lived in, with his wife in an understanding way. He knows it's a death wish to call her an old lady. But, as the text says, he's righteous and obeys God. So he would not say that. So, he, he, is, uh, he is saying, I, this didn't happen when we were young. And we're not spring chickens anymore. That door is not open anymore. And don't you want, like there's times in the, do you ever yell at movies? Don't raise your hand. Um, I know y'all sinners yell at the TV screen when your football team is getting beat. But anyway, that's a totally different issue. We want to enter into the story and say, no, Zechariah, you know the Bible. Come on, man. Abraham and Sarah were way older than you. What happened? Isaac, Jacob, and Rachel. Rachel was barren. Guess what happened? Joseph and a little later Benjamin. God provided. Don't you remember um, Hannah in the Bible? Gave birth to the last judge and kind of that intervening prophet before the judges and the kings. Samuel. Don't you remember Samuel? Don't you remember like Samson's parents were barren and then like the angel of Yahweh showed up and said you're going to have a kid and they totally did. Why don't you believe this? We kind of want to thump him in the head and wonder what's wrong with him. I think the thing, I think I know exactly what was wrong with him. It's the same thing that's wrong with us. Isn't it so much easier to believe that God will work powerfully in the lives of other people than in your life? Isn't it way safer to say, I understand the stories of the Bible but that was them and this is me and there's a difference between the two? I think it's way more difficult to make that jump than we give Zachariah credit for because we do the same exact thing. Do you ever listen to yourself try to comfort someone in the middle of their affliction? You're like, don't worry, brother or sister. God will provide. God, God has a... a, a a way of catching your tears. He clothes the lilies of the field. He provides for the sparrows. On the, I mean, we know all the verses, right? We're excellent biblical counselors or other people. And then when it's us, it doesn't apply all of a sudden. We might say it this way, grace for thee, but not for me. God works in the lives of people, but not me. I think we should cut Zechariah a little bit of slack because we would do the same thing. He struggled to receive the word of God in his own life, believing that these were things for Sarah and the Hannahs of the world and the, um, the Rachels of the world, but not for them. Not for them. Why do you think Luke records this part of the story. Why, why do you think he records that Zechariah did not believe the word? Chapter, or verse 20 says, Gabriel tells him, you, you, you don't believe what God is saying. And if you just look at, Ab I love Gabriel's answer. Look at verse 19. He says, I'm old. My wife is 
mature. Um, this can't happen. I love Gabriel's response. I am Gabriel, Manlin. That's not in the text, but um, I'm Gabriel, and I stand in God's presence. And then he just ends it. Like, that would be enough for you to know. Don't ask any more questions. Where do our prayers arise to? The presence of whom? God. Gabriel's saying, um, I get to stand in God's presence. And I know when prayers fall on his ears. And I know when he answers them. And the thing that I told you, I heard from his word or his mouth. Zechariah struggled with doubt that gnawed at his faith about the word of God, just like we do. I'm actually really comforted that Zechariah is not totally different than us. I'm actually comforted that Zechariah was a real person who wrestled with real doubts. And even when the word of God is open to him and is undeniable to him, he wrestled with it like we do. I think that's encouraging. Verse 19 Luke records that the first time, the, that ter, look at the last two words in verse 19. I bring to you good news. You know what that word is. That's the word we would translate for gospel. First occurrence in the gospel of Luke. Gabriel says, I came from God's presence with gospel news for you, with good news for you. And let me give you a sign. Verse 20. You will be silent. God's been silent for 400 years and now speaks now here, one who speaks is stricken silent. It's both a sign and a judgment. What did he ask for in verse 18? How shall I know? Basically, he's saying, what, is there a sign to let me know that this will happen? Uh, maybe he was thinking to when, uh, when Moses asked the same thing. When I go, what sign do I show Pharaoh? And he said, like, put your hand in your cloak, bring it out. It's leprous. Throw the stick on the, uh, on the ground, it's a snake. Uh, maybe he was like, can we get something like that? <laughs> uh, no, God just takes away the use of his voice. And that would immediately confirm to him, really, that Gabriel was who he says that he was. Uh, and it seems to function a bit as a, as a rebuke to his unbelief, as a corrective of, you, you ought to believe the word of God when, when it comes crashing into your life. And you might think of it as like this odd, like, why muteness? Why that? I mean, Jacob limped. And that made sense because they were wrestling. But why this? Why his voice? Now, some uh, commentators um, who will remain nameless say that uh, Zechariah was old. Something happened in the temple. He had a stroke. And it impaired his speech. And then his uh, disciples went back later and were like, we need to make a miracle out of this. Let's say he saw an angel. Um, don't read commentators like that. That's a waste of your time. I don't think he had a stroke at all. I think a real angel really showed up to him and really came from the presence of God and really was given power to strike him mute for a purpose. I said there were three duties that a priest chosen by lot to do this, um, to serve in this capacity would have on a once in a lifetime um, moment in their priestly um, duties. Offer incense. Pray for the people. Both of those have already happened. What's the third? When he would come out from the holy place, who is outside praying? The congregation. And what would that priest do? He would offer the ironic blessing upon his people. He would, as a son of Aaron, do something only the sons of Aaron were allowed to do. It was actually to utter words that were specially given to his family to bless that specific nation, as recorded in Numbers 6, 23. Speak to Aaron and his sons. Who? Who do we have in our text this morning? Well, I, have, I have a son from Aaron. I have a daughter from Aaron. The, the, this is their family. Speak to Aaron and his sons and say, Thus you shall bless the nation of Israel. So this is to be used as a, a benediction or a word of blessing. Listen to what the benediction is. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
the Lord make His face to shine upon you. What are the next words? And be gracious. What does John's name mean? God has been gracious. May God be gracious to you. May God lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And can you imagine Zechariah coming out of the temple, standing before the congregation and saying, God be gracious to you, but I didn't think it would be for me. God, look upon you. But I wonder if my way has been hidden from the Lord. God, show you favor, but I don't believe there's any for me. And in the sign that functions as a reproach, he doesn't get to do that. And you might say, like, that's a huge bummer, once in a lifetime thing, and you only got to do two of the three. And maybe, well, it's hard to pick a favorite among them, but, but that's a big one. Reading your family's blessing over the nation that's praying, that's kind of a big deal. I don't know exactly how long the charades went on trying to communicate, like, big angel in there. <laughs> um, I don't think he knew ASL, so it would have been humorous to watch, but at some point, a switch would have had to have been made. And Zechariah would have had to have stood off to the side. And another son of Aaron would have to read it. And guess what Zechariah would be doing at that point? Not speaking. Listening. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you his peace. I think on that day, this son of Aaron needed to hear Aaron's blessing, not speak it. Because he doubted was really at the heart of it, just like we do. Fourthly, this morning, and shorter than some of the others, I hope, the God who fulfills his oath. The God who fulfills his oath. Verse 24, after the, these, um, well, excuse me, verse 23, and when his time of service had ended, when the week was up, he went home. Can you imagine the thoughts of, that were going through his mind as he's walking home being like, how do I explain this to Elizabeth? Wait, I can't explain this to Elizabeth. This is going to be awkward. Uh, can't talk. You wonder how long it took him through whatever means to communicate to her an angel of God came and told us we're going to have a baby and that he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. That might have taken a long time, <laughs> especially if she couldn't read and write. We don't know. But he goes home and look at verse 24. I mean, you should just be smiling ear to ear, having read this so many times on the pages of Scripture. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived... God loves to bring life out of death. God loves, I, I teach it all the time in the 8th grade uh, Old Testament survey that I teach at, at Providence. I teach it all the time. God loves, God delights to bless the lesser. God loves to take unloved Leahs and make them part of Messiah's line. God loves to take the, the, the Tamars of the world and make them in the line of Messiah. God loves to take the Rahabs of the world and to elevate the Abrahams of the world. And he loves to do that. And isn't that one of the key themes we said would run through Luke's gospel? prayer and, a, and God's delight to bless the lesser. Here in one, the first story out of the gate, God takes a, a downtrodden couple who've been faithfully trying to walk with the Lord, who, who had decades of pain and difficulty, who faithfully prayed, and he says, you know what? Now I will work, and now I will raise you from the ash heap, and I will bless you abundantly. Well, we should just rejoice that God blesses people like Elizabeth and people like Zechariah because it means he loves to do the same also for us. He loves to bless the downcast. He loves to bless the lesser. After these days, Elizabeth conceived just like God promised he would, or if you would allow the use of the word, just like he oathed 
to her. You know what Elizabeth's name means, by the way? God is my oath. Well, God is the God who promises. Here, Elizabeth, whose name means God keeps his promises, is the recipient of God keeping his promises. And she keeps herself hidden for five months. You might say, is that unbelief? Don't think it is. Verse 25 leads me to think it's not unbelief. Could you imagine the scorn and the reproach if not older, mature, Elizabeth started going around the town telling everybody, I'm pregnant? They'd be like, yeah, sure. Not only does she have secret sin, the mental cheese has slipped off the cracker. Um, they would say, crazy old Elizabeth. What happens at five months? No one can deny that you're pregnant. I remember when Lacey and I were pregnant with our first one, and we, we, we went through years of barrenness. Y- years of barrenness. It was hard to believe the doctors, even though they could show you a, a little picture of something that looked like a piece of rice. They were like, that's a baby. <laughs> you are taking it on faith. that you, They know what that is. Um, and there are times where I had to ask my wife, are you sure you're pregnant? Nothing... You look the same. (laughs) At five months, I couldn't doubt it. She couldn't doubt it. Our friends couldn't doubt it. Do you know how big the smile must have been on Elizabeth's face? When all of her friends who thought that she was rejected by God, now seen as a mother, Look at verse 25. The Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. Now there are times in the Bible, it happens all over the place, where people speak way better than they know. This is one of them. Did God remove her reproach? He did. Her friends now knew she, w- they, they knew she wasn't barren because of some secret weird sin. But notice the language she uses. I like the ESV, but it's a little vanilla right here. When he looked on me, kind of just a generic way of describing it. We're like, yeah, did you go, did you go see that new thing? Yeah, I looked at it. It's interesting. It's like a, we would use the word very casually. The word that she would use, the word that she actually did use, has the idea of like to gaze upon. What lie did I suspect Zechariah and Elizabeth might have fallen into believing? God doesn't, what? See me? Isn't it eerily close to the ironic blessing the Lord make His face to what? Shine on you? Lift His countenance upon you? Gaze upon you? Elizabeth knows My way was not hidden from the Lord. And my rights weren't ignored by Him. He saw me. And He answered. And He took away my reproach. Now on one level, that is true. Those who thought it was due to sin, now know it wasn't. But she speaks better than she knows. The one in her womb is the forerunner of who? The Messiah coming into the world. And what will that Messiah do with all of our reproach? Well, I'll read it to you. Isaiah 25, verse 8. He, speaking of God, will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the what? Reproach of His people He will take away. The Lord has spoken. And what brought all this about? The Lord has heard your prayer, verse 13. I want to make two applications as we're already way over time, but no one cares, right? So, I want to make two applications. God absolutely sees you hears you, and is a God who delights to answer prayer. 
You cannot walk away from this narrative, this story, without that. God is the God who pray or God who God who hears prayer, and so the the push for His people should be: Well, if God hears prayer, what should we do? It's so obvious. Pray. Call on his name. What if he delays a long time? Keep on praying. That's one. Now, now you might follow it up with a really important question, which I hope you are thinking. Are you saying that God will answer positively and affirmatively every prayer I pray? No, I'm not saying that. There are people in this world who will pray for children and not have that prayer answered yes. There are people in this world who will pray to be set free from physical ailments or um, so many, so many different things. Am I saying that this is some sort of name it, claim it? <laughs> no, not at all. But what an invitation to come and pray. I love it the way, the way one English Puritan said, I think it was John Bunyan. If it's not, it's someone else and they'll get the glory when we pray, we either get the thing prayed for, or we get the thing we should have prayed for. <laughs> there are prayers I've prayed that I'm happy God did not answer them. As I think, so have you. But what a gracious invitation to combat the doubts in our life that says, God's forgotten me, God doesn't see me, God doesn't care. To say that's not true, and I know it's not true because the Bible clearly says God sees me and cares. And to go from that place in life before the throne of mercy and prayer, and like the, like the friend at midnight, or the widow of importunity, or all of the other parables that we're going to get to in this gospel about persistence in prayer, knowing he's a good God, knowing he cares, he sees and he cares, and the God of the universe will do what is right, and that we can trust him. He uses prayer, and we can trust him to do what is right. And sometimes that is in him saying, no. My child, I have other things for you. But those should not discourage us from praying. I want to leave you with one of the stanzas from that hymn, Whatever My God Ordains Is Right. My prayer is that this would be our, our posturing in prayer before God. Whatever my God ordains is right. He never will deceive me. He leads me by the proper path. I know that he will not leave me. I take content what he has sent. And his hand can turn my griefs away. And patiently I wait for his day. I pray. I know he sees. I know that he cares. I know that what happens in my life comes from him. And I know that that is the good portion, even if I don't know how it is the good portion. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do two things. I'm going to pray and I'm going to wait. And either he'll give me the thing prayed for or he'll give me what I ought to have prayed for. And either way, we can say in accord with or in agreement with Numbers 6, God is indeed gracious to his people. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, give us faith to follow after you. Give us faith to trust you for your promises. Make us a people of prayer, we pray, O oh God. Make us a people who storm the mercy seat, who do not give you rest. May we hear the words of Isaiah, those who put the Lord in remembrance, give him no rest. Father, I pray in particular for those among us who are in a long season of feeling like you do not hear their prayers and do not see them. Lord, I pray by your Spirit you would comfort them in the inner man. You see, you hear, 
and we should wait for you. Father, I pray that in the season of waiting, our faith wouldn't falter. I pray that in the seasons of your delays, or in, in the, when you answer no, that we would not question your goodness, but that we would know you are a God who hears prayer and you delight to lift up the downcast. Father, you have already answered yes resoundingly to the greatest prayer that we can pray. Father, forgive us. And you have. How much more will you answer lesser things? Give us faith to walk not by what we see, but by what we know from your word. We pray this in our Savior's name. Amen.